Avatar The Frontiers of Pandora is bad, but also great, which is annoying because now I have to do another nuanced critique and have all of you sour farts in the comments section telling me that I go too easy on corporate slop. And you know what? Okay, did that thing just move? Frontiers of Pandora is a tragedy of unparalleled proportions. Every flaw, every failure, and every missed opportunity can be tracked back to one thing. And that is... So join me on another adventure as I take a harsh look at Avatar Frontiers of Pandora. And while doing so, I'm going to be taking this thing apart to figure out what the hell it is and why it attacked me in the last video. Let's gear up and find out. If we are going to talk about Avatar, we should probably start from the beginning! Well, that's oddly concerning. Frontiers of Pandora's opening is half bad, but also half good. And I don't mean that there are elements that work and there are elements that don't. I literally mean that the first half of the opening is a disingenuous mess of mistranslated emotional beats, while the second half is an organically flowing thrill ride introducing the player to the amounts of fun that they can expect to have whilst exploring Pandora. And this 50-50 split isn't really Ubisoft's fault, it's Avatar's. Unlike the 2009 game where the events of the film got reimagined to cater to a video game, Frontiers of Pandora is set within the same story of the two films. Meaning this time, Ubisoft didn't get unmitigated freedom while writing the story. They have restrictions. And it shows. In the first Avatar film, it is explained that nearly a decade ago from the events of that film, the humans tried opening up schools in order to teach the Na'vi about humans. Language, culture, Funko Pops, you get the idea. With all the schools kind of falling apart as the human and Na'vi relations kind of went sour. And this is where Ubisoft's Avatar comes into play. The opening sees us play as a Na'vi child who was rescued by the RDA. Where every other Na'vi school failed as a result of the Na'vi relations going to the wayside, the RDA through the TAP program has made a school where the Na'vi children are never exposed to their people or their culture outside of the faintest memory of a song sung by the Sarantu clan. Can um, anyone tell me how that can be done? <laughs> This song is going to be very important by the end of this video, to the point it's going to make a lot of you very, very angry. But we'll get to that when that time arises. The game opens with us in class and we are introduced to all five of the TAP students. Taylan, Noor, Renella, ourselves, and Ahari, our sister. Don't worry about the names here, for the most part we'll be mostly talking about ourselves and Taylan in this video, because would you believe it, when it came to writing characters in an Ubisoft game, Ubisoft forgot to write characters. Who saw that coming, right? <laughs> it is here that we are introduced to John Mercer, the leader of the RDA forces tackling this region of Pandora. The idea of the TAP program is to avoid human Na'vi hybrids making contact with the Na'vi and instead having pure-blooded Na'vi who are sympathetic to the RDA handling diplomatic missions. You've probably noticed by now that I've been over-explaining a lot of concepts to you right now, and I am deeply sorry, but imagine my surprise when this game explains nothing and just expects you to know shit off by heart. Believe me, I wish I could delve into what actually happens in this opening, but if I did, you would lose your mind. Don't believe me. The game opens with you, an alien, being taught about an ambassador program when John Mercer walks in and hears a Hari singing. Because of a child singing, he then says that nobody gets dinner and threatens to steal your bracelet even though you didn't do anything. You then plan to escape. You get caught, hum a song loudly at the people with the guns so they'll set you free and then Mercer kills your sister and steals your bracelet and what the f*** yeah. is going on? Shut up! Stop singing! Oh, oh, oh. 
it would be psychotic of me to tell you right now that this bracelet holds special significance and that this song is arguably the most important element of the game. But that is the case. This blunder of an opening is actually quite interesting when you know what the bracelet means and how important Ahari's song is. I want you to grip onto how confusing and goofy this scene right here is. We saved you, gave you home, an identity. We already had an identity. We are not me. No! You are what I made you. Yeah, you are. We may not remember the words, yeah, but we can still sing the songs of our people. Stop singing. Shut up! Oh, and what about that bracelet? Who cares if he takes a bracelet? Hold on to that feeling, because you are not wrong for feeling that all of this is kind of dumb. Bracelets in Navi culture are known as song chords, with different rare and raw materials representing different feelings, emotions, victories, and traumas. Any Navi from any clan can walk up to another Navi, and with a simple glance can read an entire Navi's life story simply from one song chord. The human equivalent would be stalking someone on Instagram or asking them what they thought about the Barbie movie. Song chords are a physical signaling to others about how mighty and how powerful one person can be. It is a telling of your life story. As for Ahari's song, it's actually the song of your people, the Sarantu. Since your clan vanished when you were just a baby, the only thing you have left are the faintest memories of a lullaby. A lullaby you remember so faintly that none of you know the words to it. All you can do is hum what you know. Having the TAP students all reject the ways of the RDA by holding onto arguably the one thing they have left that you remember of your clan is quite significant. Mercer single-handedly not only silences the song with the echoing ring of a gunshot, kills the only person you share blood with, but also steals your mother's song chord. In the span of a single minute, Mercer has silenced the songs in your head, killed your only family, and has also stolen the only stories that you ever had of your mother. Mercer, without touching you, has killed what Navi you had left in you. And as of this moment, you are the most human you have ever been. And being human is a dark and twisted fate for a Navi. The game illustrates how big and strong you are compared to humans, but at this moment here, the humans tower over you. And as he takes your bracelet, for the first time ever, out of pure fear, you are on the same eye level. Well, you know what? This opening is kind of amazing. When you've already finished the bloody game, you have no way of understanding any of these concepts during the opening, which results in what could have been a heartbreaking origin for our character, ending up as a sour first taste to what ultimately could be a good game. Hell, the game knows you are going to struggle to understand things. Booting up the game results in a time period exclaimer, an exclaimer telling you where you are and what you're doing, an exposition dump establishing where you are and what what you're doing. Let's review the ambassador program. When the RDA discovered Pandora. Followed by the villain expositing where you are and what you do. We have given you a future. A purpose. Followed by an indulgent amount of characters talking about not liking where they are and what they are doing. Don't tell me where I am. Show me. Don't tell me how to feel. Make me feel it. I must add here that during the opening where all of this is happening, at no point do you get to take control of the character. No tedious tasks to set the tone of hatred for the RDA, no stealthy segment when you try to escape the RDA, and no action-packed getaway section where they eventually catch you. Instead, you just have to watch as all of this unfolds, which is super insane considering the game's about to do an eight year time jump, make us watch another escape from the RDA, then do another time skip, which will be another 16 years, only to result in us finally doing a stealth mission and trying out the combat and finally escaping the RDA when it ultimately doesn't matter. Ubisoft, 
My man, if setting up your story for Navi raised by the RDA requires this much effort and this much tedious shit to make work, maybe just start your game where it begins? Time skipping can be a really good tool when used correctly, illustrating a massive contrast between periods of time and the feelings our characters express through those time skips can be a really useful tool. But having your characters hate the RDA, time skip to a point where they hate the RDA, and then do another 16 year time skip where they still hate the RDA is insane. The Na'vi you play as are children. Make it that they love the RDA. Illustrate to the player how far gone these Na'vi children are from their own culture. Then after a slow build of many years slowly being skipped through, then have John Mercer demand the killing of the TAP students as the humans are evacuating the planet during the ending of the events of the first film. The amount of emotion our character would be going through would make for a very interesting setup. Make it that Ahari gets killed here and everyone else is gravely injured. And before you can finally process the grief of what's just happened to you, you need to be put into cryo and remain there until your teacher can find help and supplies to save you from your injuries. You wake up not knowing it's been 16 years and you find the decayed body of your sister. And now you want payback. The time skips are unavoidable due to the game insisting it wants to take place alongside the second film. And that's fine, but at least use the time skips as a means to convey emotion. The first set of drawn out time skips could illustrate the RDA's kind but ultimately manipulative nature. From here have a massive betrayal and the death of your sister and then the final time skip having you wake up to your long dead sister 16 years into the future, forever losing the chance to mourn her. Happiness. Time skip. Betrayal. Time skip. Pain. From here, you can introduce the player to the resistance, and they have seen enough to at least motivate them to go kill some RDA scum. But the combination of a lack of understanding of Navi culture mixed with the death of a character you don't care about dying like an idiot, and topping it all off with time skips and leaving the player confused is not how you should ever, ever start your game's story. The second half of the opening though, illustrates how fun this game can actually be. Sneaking around, punching bad guys, learning the cool combat system, walking out into Pandora for the very first time and seeing this. Walking out into Pandora for the very first time is truly a sight to behold, and we will keep talking about the story shortly, but the story is only a small part of what is ultimately a very big game. Now that we've got the opening out of the way, we can finally talk about... <coughs> What's wrong with this game? <sighs> Your orders. Kill, kill, kill. It is right. Can you figure out the here? Orders. Hmm. I have eyes on the target, my master. I fear he is on to us. Shall I make contact and deal with our little problem? As you wish, my master. Frontiers of Pandora has a really weird problem that I have never seen in a video game before. A problem so monumentous that even explaining it to you will have you scratching your head. So, 
Let me just be plain. Everything that is good in this game is actually bad. And I mean everything. Excluding the story, because for the story to have turned out to be bad, it would have to start off making you think it's good. So let's begin with the gameplay loop. Avatar has quite an interesting gameplay loop, as you will only spend 15% of the actual game in combat. And surprisingly, the game doesn't suffer for that. The Avatar film struggled trying to convey Navi culture in a way that won't put general audiences to sleep. I love these movies personally, but there is a lot that goes over people's heads unless they are watching for a second time. Case in point that will help you understand the Navi, the Navi have a god and it is canonically real. And I don't mean that they worship the trees and all life is sacred. No, I literally mean that the Na'vi have a real god that is real and they communicate with it often. They have a real afterlife that does exist and their god has the ability to intervene in the matters of preserving Pandora's ecosystem. The Na'vi aren't just tree huggers that love the way of nature. The RDA killing the environment is quite literally them murdering their god. This god is known as Awa. Awa is everything from the dirt beneath your feet to the trees that the Na'vi build their homes in and in a kind of sense includes the Na'vi as any kind of energy that the Na'vi take must be returned to Awa after their death. Now why am I explaining this to you? Well it's because the gameplay loop while focusing on killing the RDA relies solely on your interactions with Awa while prepping for those fights. The gameplay loop kind of goes something like this. Hunt, forage, cook, craft, explore, combat. Hunt, forage, cook, explore, combat, hunt, for you, you get the idea. This gameplay loop will be consistent throughout the game, and it's pretty fun. The game through these tasks will allow you to learn Navi culture, their ways, and make a connection to their god, and in turn makes you want to kill more RDA. It uh, makes it all the more sweeter. But as I said before, everything that is good about this game is actually bad. Let's start with hunting. Hunting is really fun. Through the in-game wiki, you can find the locations of certain animals and hunt them for their meat and other materials, which can eventually be used for crafting. The better you hunt an animal, the better and more plentiful the resources you will receive from that hunted animal. The materials that you obtain from a hunt are called gifts, as Awa created the creatures and that you are taking away the life she created to sustain your own. With killing her creatures, it is always best that you do so in not only a clean manner, but a merciful one as well. A clean kill is hitting an animal in its weak spot, and a merciful kill is ensuring the animal is dead within the first three seconds of it struggling on the ground. Mindlessly shooting an animal will result in an unclean kill, and not putting an animal down fast enough will result in a merciless kill. Fumble both and there is a chance that the animal will become tainted or ruined, resulting in no gifts whatsoever. You've gone against the way of Awa, and now you shall not be rewarded. Sounds pretty neat, right? Yeah. And then there's tracking. Through the Navi wiki, you will always be able to find the animal you want to hunt, but early on, your bow just doesn't do enough damage to kill an animal in a single hit, even through their weak spot, resulting in an animal running away. Without the choice of shooting it mindlessly as you won't get a clean kill, you're forced to track it, with the main problems being that the animals are always faster than you, and by following the scent and not going slow, you'll result in scaring off the animal again. But go too slow, and you'll lose the scent. Or worse, you're gonna get bored. Late game hunting is great. Strong bows, tons of perks that don't make the animals uh, scared of you. It's fantastic. But by that point, you've already done tons of hunting and have a sour taste in your mouth, resulting in hunting being a task forced onto you instead of it being a test of skill that you want to engage in. Now, it makes sense through the story that you would be terrible at hunting early on. You're a wayward soul trying to reconnect with your Navi ways. So understandably, your character is new to things and has no idea on what they are doing. But putting the player in a situation where they cannot have fun because of a story beat is not how you get a player engaged. Some players may be motivated to level up and get better at hunting, but for the wider majority you are just gonna see hunting as a chore, because that's just how it's set up from the second you enter Pandora. And you do 100% need to hunt in this game in order to survive, but I'll explain why shortly. Next we have foraging. Foraging, much like hunting, is a means of gathering resources for future endeavors, and the process of gathering is quite fun. 
to start with. When foraging, you will be given a mini game where you get to pluck a piece of fruit or snap a branch. And depending on how well you do, it will result in a higher rarity of that resource. You grab the fruit and pull in a particular direction. And if it's the correct direction, it'll give you a tasty treat. Whoever set this up needs to be given a medal. Making an engaging mini game out of plucking fruit? That's genius. Now let's hope that medal is bulletproof because we're gonna be shooting that same man in the back of the head in a Wendy's parking lot. Because what kind of idiot sees the concept of picking up an item in a game and decides that it needs to take time? Picking a piece of fruit is all fun in theory, but you're not just picking up a piece of fruit. You're picking up 20 of them. If I told you that picking up five items in any game would take up to a minute of in-game time, you'd call me a liar and put me in a padded cell. And it's not like the devs didn't know this would eventually get boring because the one plant that you don't need to do this mini game for is the healing item. They know that you're going to be picking up hundreds of these and it would get annoying. So why you thought that this wouldn't get annoying here is beyond me. Here, just look at this. Oh yeah, now this is a game that definitely needs to cost a hundred dollars. Next, we have a reason why hunting and foraging is so necessary. Cooking. Avatar doesn't have a regular healing system. It instead relies on a hunger system as a kind of built-in substitute. Where most games would have you starved to death if you don't eat, Avatar sets up food as a means for healing. Not that food heals you when you eat it, but instead has it that when you have eaten a meal, passive health regen is enabled. Leave your character hungry and you are going to find fights a tad tricky when your healing items start to run out. But food isn't just a means for healing. It's also an opportunity to obtain bugs. Buffs. Very necessary buffs. On higher difficulties, Avatar is rough. To make the game easier, you can mix and match ingredients in order to obtain certain kinds of buffs in order to aid you in certain situations. More health, more damage, harder to be sighted, immune to fire, with specific ingredients giving you stronger buffs being harder to hunt. Go into a bigger fight with a shitty meal and you are going to get clapped. Instead, whip out the grill and make yourself a seasoned steak and you'll be having a grand old time. Cooking can be a really fun way to utilize all the the resources you've obtained through your hunts, which is great. What isn't great is the cooking itself. Hunting animals is tedious and time consuming. Picking fruit is boring and drawn out. And now that I've got all of these items to start cooking, I need to do... Uh, yeah. I need to wait some more? The same. Long boring animation again and again and again until you finally have cooked all eight of your meals and you're good to go. Now this wouldn't be too much of a problem if you didn't have to do this exact long drawn out process every one to two hours in the game. No, 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 not the cooking, all of this. The hunting, the foraging, the cooking, all of it. Now, in the game's defense, you will find tons of fruit as you are making your way to your quest. Plants are plentiful and are never out of the way. So you can just cook fruit meals and save yourself the time. But if I have to stop every 20 seconds to pick a piece of fruit in order to wait an additional three minutes in order to make combat viable in my resistance action sci-fi game, maybe that's not a good way to keep the player engaged. Frontiers of Pandora loves showing off how the world of Pandora works to the point that when the magic finally does wear off and you do just want to blow up things in a video game, the game's drawn out gameplay starts to rub the player the wrong way. It's all fun and it's all beautiful just not the 50th time around. Crafting suffers from this as well. The leveling system for Avatar is tied to your gear, meaning you can't just level up by completing quests. You need to unlock better gear. You'll sometimes get gear by doing a side quest and it may even be the item that you need. But for the most part, you will be slaving away, running around the map, trying to hunt particular animals so that you can gain a single part of a bow. But then you don't get to craft it. You've got to go get the other pieces too. Now that sounds great in theory, 
inventory until you need to craft five different pieces of armor with each needing different hides and materials. And even when you craft what you need, it might not be a high enough rarity, meaning you'll actually go down levels. And even when that's done, if I have one item extremely underleveled and I can't get my hands on what I need, you're just fucked. Meaning that level 14 quest that you wanted to do, but you're level 12, sorry buddy, you're about to get shagged. In no situation when playing on the two highest difficulties can you run and gun your way through the game with being three levels below where you need to be. And that's okay. A game punishing you for being underleveled is okay. But the fact that I can do 10 side quests and not go up a single level is barbaric. The crafting of cooler gear is fun. Leveling up in any video game is fun. But linking the two and making the gear crafting take three planet rotations is just diabolical. The only other way to level up is spending skill points, and you can just find them around the map. But what kind of dev team tells the player, Hey, you just blew up an oil rig and had lots of fun killing mechs. For your next task, fly around the map for two hours doing nothing. Crafting should be fun, not a task I'm forced into doing because if I don't, I can't play your game. I don't think I need to drag this shit out anymore for you to understand. Even with the aspects I'm about to talk about, you'll see this trend. Look, how about exploring? Exploring the forests and plains of Pandora is fantastic. Plenty of things to see with built-in mechanics to make traversal feel smoother. For the forests, it's spores that make you run faster whilst traveling by the vines. And for the plains, you can unlock the Dire Horse. Amazing traversal that allows the player to see and do a lot on their way to missions, which gets ruined early in the game when the game just hands you a fighter jet, incentivizing the player to skip over everything. Do you have any idea how much easier the hunting and foraging would be if you just casually did it on your way to missions in new areas? You would never be forced to do those things. Instead, it would be just something you do on the way to doing something that you want to do. And that's not to say that unlocking your ecran isn't fun in of itself. You're just trading the entire game's world and exploration for the chance to do a backflip. Oh hell, hell yeah! Yes, I know that wasn't a backflip. Shut up. Oh, and combat. Ah, the combat in this game is amazing when you're allowed to do it. Look, I said before that the combat is only like 15 to 25% of the game, and that's fine when you are enjoying everything else. My problem isn't how spaced apart the combat is. My problem is the game punishing you for having fun. What? The game has a neat resource called parts. Parts can be found at RDA bases and outposts. Parts can be saved up to buy gear and ingredients in order to make yourself stronger over a long period of time, ensuring that you are never underleveled. Or you can use your parts to create special ammunitions to make your weapons do more damage, with the most common being explosive. It's a fun balancing act. Do you save up this resource in order to make your character more powerful over a long period of time, or do you blast through your parts now? now and be much more powerful for a short period of time. Parts make for a fantastic choice for the player when you can find them. If you were to say only get 10 parts per hour, but you were spending those parts at 20 parts an hour, you are going to put yourself in an awkward situation where you now are under leveled and have no real way of killing higher level enemies for quests that you need to do right fucking now. So in that situation, it's back to what I was complaining about before, the boring, tedious grind of trying to get better gear. Now, yes, this is a punishment for the player making a poor decision. And while I can see why that's the case and you could consider that good game design, really, it's not the player's fault because you are actively punished for using parts. No, not using them all, just using parts in general. Larger outposts work on a sort of stealth system. If you manage to rig the base to explode without the RDA noticing what you are doing, they will then leave in a hurry, resulting in more parts being left behind. But if you decide you want to have, say, a shootout and use those parts to make explosives, the enemies are going to know that you are attacking, resulting in them having more time time to evacuate, resulting in less parts being left behind. Which is completely, and I'm sorry, I, I understand what the game's trying to do here, but that is completely unfair. You've given every single weapon a loud offensive alternative that makes the game more fun, but you've made it that having fun means you don't get to have more fun later on. Punishing a player for messing up is fine. That's literally what health is in every video game. You make a poor decision and you get closer to death. But here, the punishment 
punishment is not being allowed to have fun because you decided to have fun. I mean, yeah, you can have fun stealthing your way through every RDA map, but there are mechs running around everywhere and I just want to punch some guys in the face. What would have been better is to allow there to be different means of obtaining more parts. Stealth your way through an outpost and there will be a larger treasure trove of parts waiting for you at the end. You can now buy better gear. <clears throat> Whilst using parts to build explosives could rip apart amp suits, something that no other weapon can do, which could result in obtaining parts from those amp suits. The punishment for a stealth run is getting caught. You now get less parts. The punishment for the loud offense is missing. You miss your shot, you'd have wasted parts on an explosive that didn't land. And the game clearly doesn't mind giving you the choice of these two, as it will just give you regular guns for when things get loud. What results from this is players being allowed to play as they want, but ultimately punishing those that chose to be an action hero in your resistance rebel game. And speaking of wh <laughs> fuck's sake, I think it's time that we start talking about the story. Or what's worse, the characters. Your orders are clear. Kill the target before his memories return. Killing him is the only way to reboot his mind. If he figures out that we are holding him in this simulated reality, who knows what he might do? No, that, that doesn't make sense. It, if that were true, then the videos, the ship, the 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 fighting it none of this is real mm, well 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 <laughs> at last he finally he figures, it out. figures it out <laughs> Far Cry, but blue. Ever since this game's first trailer, that phrase has been a plague on this game's merit. It's a shallow remark that puts Avatar Frontiers of Pandora in a box. That before release, I longed and hoped it would not fit in. But it doesn't matter what I wish for. We need to face the facts. I have finished the game. I've journeyed around Pandora. I've engrossed myself with its themes, and I've also had to endure the story. And Avatar is two things. Avatar Frontiers of Pandora is Far Cry, but blue, but it is also Far Cry, but better. Avatar's story is a thing of beauty when it works. It's the generic resistance story told in a setting that actually suits the genre of the Far Cry games, far better than any Far Cry itself. There are only so many times I can take out a dictator, and it is sad to see the Far Cry series stagnate as much as it has. That's not to say that the games are completely shit. There is plenty of fun to be had. Go watch my Far Cry 6 video. But Avatar just works better. You are a nine foot tall killing machine. You can jump over walls, you can go toe to toe with giant mechs and soar through the winds ripping ships out of the sky. Avatar as an action game does work better when the game is just take out the outpost and you win. And while the opening has some serious hang ups when it comes to time establishment, Frontiers 100% knows what it's doing after that point. Until you get to the end. After your teacher wakes you up from cryo, you manage to escape the TAP facility and join the resistance in an attempt to make a stance against the return of the RDA 16 years after they had left. However, before we dive into things here, I do need to point out a plot hole in the game's story. You are in cryo as to keep you safe and away from the RDA. The RDA then leaves the planet and does not return for 16 years. It is only once the RDA have returned that your teacher who has sided with the Na'vi for over a decade now goes on a mission to rescue you with the help of the resistance. In no way does the game explain why Alma didn't come and free you sooner, aside from the throwaway line of the RDA blew up the building so I just assumed you were dead. What happened back there? Tap was in ruins. Mercer ordered it destroyed when they evacuated. I watched the walls collapse in. 
on you. I thought you were dead. Despite the building having just some minor overgrowth, so yeah, kind of weird. She talks about how she missed you and how she couldn't have known if you were still alive. But the tap facility for this entire 16 year period has been a mere two kilometers away. And yes, I am using kilometers. The RDA use miles and they are the bad guys. We are a more civilized people. 10 millimeters is a centimeter, 100 centimeters is a meter, and a thousand meters is a kilometer. How the fuck are you Americans still using the mind? In no logical sense should the woman who raised you and a turned against humanity in order to save you, not want to free you the second you are safe from the RDA. It's not like they couldn't get you, Alma would have had access to the facility, as she had access before the evacuation, and there is no way that the RDA could have known she turned on them as they all had fled. You can't make the argument that the facility would have been out of power, because how would you still be in cryostasis if the power went out? The game is so desperate for you to be playing alongside the events of the second film, that the one character you feel like you can trust is now the person who abandoned you. And that's just not how the game sees things, which just leaves the player confused as shit. I assumed there would be a twist about how Alma only set you free because they needed to use you as a tool. She only woke you up when it was convenient, which Alma will turn out to be kind of a shitty person later in the game, but for these reasons instead of these reasons, which is just kind of dumb. While joining the resistance is one of the main focal points of the game's story, another is your lack of connection to who your original clan was. Before you were taken by the RDA, you were a part of the Sarantu clan, a clan dedicated to the spreading of stories and would also be a diplomatic crutch between all of the neighboring clans. With the Sarantu clan mysteriously gone, you are the last surviving children of the long gone clan. Not only is the story about freeing Pandora of the RDA plague, but also also your efforts to connect with your ancestral ways. With you being a descendant of the Sarantu, you are assigned with the recruiting of the other nearby clans, as the Sarantu once held mighty powerful connections with the clans many, many years back. In the pursuit of connecting the clans, you will learn more about the Sarantu through the memories and experiences that these clans had once with your own. There are three clans you will try to recruit to the Resistance, with each not only suffering from RDA's presence in different ways, but they also represent a key element element of the Sarantu. The first clan you will meet is the Arantia clan, the people of the silk weave who dedicate their lives to the art of the dye, with their colourful clothes reflecting that as well. They are also a good starting point for your journey, and will even point out how despite being a pure-blooded Navi, you are indistinguishable from that of a human, one of the sky people. What's that on your face? It is the mark of the Sarantu. And yet the Sarantu we once knew did not defy Ewa with scraps from the Sky People. It's all I know. They stole us when we were children. They have stolen many things. You were gone a long time. And you are young. Has your spirit been molded by the Sky People? Or do you remember the ways of your clan? Shoo! Put that away. <clears throat> Sharp eyes. A Sarantu's gaze. But yours is heavy. Let home tree be a refuge from your burdens. We will put some color in your cheeks, or in your clothes at the very least. You will pick up the threads of your people here. Oh, how I miss their stories. They loved our silk harvest, the sweet smell of dye my own too. Got not. Let me take the Sarantu. The poor child knows nothing of our ways. Go. We will speak more when you are settled. The Arantia clan represents the Sarantu's export of stories, an artistic outlet for the Sarantu to communicate with other clans. Through your quests with the Arantia clan, a new system is unlocked, investigations, and it is through investigation segments of the game that you can connect with the Sarantu skills of crafting and discovering the truth within stories, with the player character even speaking aloud the tales of what you see. A food parcel. Unfinished. He threw headpiece. Where did he go? An Ikran headpiece. The leather snapped. Something was desperate to get out. Running away or after something. Someone or something interrupted him before he could eat. An Ikran fought in this cave. Its headpiece snapped in the struggle. Clawed its way out. A Natvi fought with RDA. Natvi skills were winning, but then their bow broke. Had to flee. Itu landed with his Ikran Somme. 
They fought the RDA. They got trapped in the cave, but escaped up there. Is that Ikran blood? A scent trail to follow. It is through the weavers of the silk that you learn to become a weaver of stories. You'll eventually use your ability to craft stories to save the Aranja clan from losing the one thing they cannot live without, their silk. By connecting with the moths that create the silk for the clan, you are able to verbalize what is killing off the moths through their memories, something that no one in the clan has been able to pull off. And in doing so, you use storytelling to save a clan's whole identity. And with that, you've recruited the Aranja clan. It was the sky people and their floating machines. They're strange, pulsing, forcing the flowers close, driving the king law from their nest. Only the Sarent who believed me. In the end, it was the Sarent who saved our home. Uh. Etua is right. War is upon us, and Ewa cries out in pain. We will purge these lands and skies of their blight. For our children and their children. Pandora will be free! And you are now off to the plains. The clan we need to discuss now is the Zeswa, the wandering clan of the upper plains. The plains are a beautiful sprawling grassland, which offers a change of scenery compared to the lower forests. The Zeswa represent the Sarantu's diplomatic skills and their need to build connections. Through your quests with the Zeswa, you will learn of their reliance on a creature called the Zakru, with the Zakru being intelligent creatures that offer the Zeswa their milk in trade for care and nurture. What's his name? Ah, Pasu. It means berry. Like these. He likes them best. Pasu. It doesn't look very tasty. <laughs> they are not for eating. They make him feel beautiful. Here. Just for you. You are friends now. In Zakru, never forget a friend. But it is only once the RDA kill a single Zakru that you truly see the relationship that these Navi have with their Zakru brothers. Wake up! Wake up! Come back to us. Pascaline! The sky people devour everything! Rally your people, warrior. We ride to battle. It is through the Zeswa's suffering that you are pushed into a diplomatic situation. In the hopes of taking out the poaching labs that are killing off the Zakru, you pursue an alliance between the Arancha clan and the Zeswa, with your efforts resulting in the RDA getting their shit rocked. <laughs> it is through a coexistence of the Zeswa and the Zakru that you yourself learn how to bring neighboring clans together, another distinct trait of a true Zeswa. The last clan you will meet are the Kamatiri. However, unlike the thriving clans of the lower forests or the upper plains, the Kamatiri lay hidden in shame and seclusion, with their talents of being mighty healers dying off as the years have gone by. This is the first clan that you'll meet in the game that outright despise you, with their leader even calling you a liar for you even insinuating that you could be a Sarantu. A Sarantu? They have the mark. The Sarent will return. Why have they come? The Sarent lives. 
that plan is long gone. Who dares to darken our threshold with lies? We need help. There is nothing for you here. The Sarantu no longer walk among us. Only liars. You desecrate the memory of our Sarantu friends. Be on your way, imposter. We have no need of you here. The Kamatiri represent the death of the Sarantu clan in more ways than one. Throughout the game, you always seek out a clan in the pursuit of learning a new skill, with the written undertones of the story also representing a key part of the Sarantu. What you seek here is the means of healing your friends after a massive attack. But here is not only the death of the Sarantu clan, but also its rebirth. By using your skills of connecting with people and storytelling, you are able to deduce that the leader of the Kamatiri clan was behind the demise of the Sarantu clan, with him directing the RDA to the Sarantu clan in order to save his own. And to cover up the RDA ever being involved with him or the attack, he spreads a lie that the Kamatiri clan's healer killed the clan with tainted medicine, lulling the clan into seclusion in shame of what they caused. They genuinely think that they killed the Sarantu, which is exactly why no one ever came looking for you. But by bringing the truth to light, the clan is able to outcast their leader and endorse a new head of the clan, revitalizing the clan's healing ways as they now know their medicine can be used once again for good. The discovery of the clan itself represents the tragic death of the Sarantu, and it is through the rebirth and the truth of the Kamatiri that the Sarantu are also brought back as well. With the truth laid bare, you are the new face of the Sarantu. Your clan, much like the Kamatiri, lives once more. Oh, and I just, I'm sorry. Using all three of the clans to represent the revitalization of your own is a fantastic writing tool. Now that we have the more subtle elements out of the way, let's talk about the story. Or more specifically, how the characters lack any. There really isn't that much of this game's story until you hit the final third of the game. It really is just a game about recruiting people to your resistance. In fact, it is insulting how similar some of this game's story beats are to Far Cry 6. You have quirky, upbeat resistance fighters. Oh my gosh, another one. I am so glad you're here since, you know, there's so few of you left. Oh god, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Welcome to Resistance HQ. <sighs> uh, right, sorry. Oh well, Nati Kamie! <laughs> what? the bouncing around the map trying to recruit allies. Oh, but don't worry guys, Far Cry 6 had this weird part where you have a small victory celebration and you end up gathering all of your allies together for that celebration and they all end up getting exposed and blown up. Unlike Avatar, where after a massive victory, you gather all your allies together for a celebration that ends up getting them exposed and blown up. Huh. And it is through this massive attack on the resistance that you will seek out the Kamatiri. This is where a lot of our characters will start to break off and start fleshing themselves out more. I personally would have developed my characters from, you know, the start of the game, but go off Ubisoft, you and your game making ways. There are many characters the game would like you to think are important, but by the end of the game, there are really only three. Alma, Taylan, and Mercer. Your character we've already been through. Your character development is through the learning of who you are and who you were always meant to be. But these three? Nah. This is a whole different kettle of fish. Alma is a bastardization of a twist villain because at the start of the game, she is a good person. At the midpoint, she is a good person. And by the end of the game, she's also uh, a good person? And if that doesn't make any sense, imagine how I felt playing the game! Alma starts off the game as your teacher and will end up being a resistance fighter. She opens the game by saving your life and her characterization from the ground up is that she's just a good person. With the twist being that she was naive in thinking the RDA wasn't going to kill the Sarantu when they were on their way to meet them. At best, she is your only mother figure that reformed herself into being a fighter for the Na'vi. At worst, she's just an idiot that saw good in tensions in the RDA. Even when watching through her memories, all you see is a heartbroken soul begging for the killing to stop. No! L let me talk to them! What are you doing? Don't let them run! Check by them in the forest! What the? 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 What And when Mercer offers her five children to raise, she says yes, as a firm no would result in their death. At best, 
She's a hero. At worst, she's kind of an idiot. But the game sure as hell doesn't see her like that. Hours before the massive attack on the resistance that is going to kick us into the third act, the game has this really weird writing problem where they know that they are going to reveal that she knew things and was kind of in on the Sarin 2 slaughter and they have to ease audiences into not liking Alma so that there is more conflict when the truth of what happened to the clan is revealed. And it mostly comes across as kind of racist? Alma has only been a helpful character up to this point, and then suddenly all the Na'vi characters start alienating her for being a half-breed, which is just- uh. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry, but there is no way that this franchise has the balls to pull that shit out of its ass. Two words. Jake Sully. You know, the half-breed that saved Pandora, the poster boy for the franchise, the literal Taruk Makto, the founder of this literal resistance. Why are characters randomly having hangups on half-breeds when this entire franchise is built from the ground up about a guy who was a half-breed who saved the world? Stupid. Alma being part of the Sarin 2 slaughter is plenty to make players curious as to what her intentions were. What isn't a good look is when a character that has not done anything wrong starts getting sass from all the characters for no reason, only for it to later justify that hate by saying she was a piece of shit the entire time. Which she isn't. It's not like she planned to kill the Sarantu, she genuinely thought they were on a diplomatic mission. What's even worse here is she is the sole reason you go find the Kamatiri because she is dying and you want to save her life. Only for you to watch her wake up and get killed again because Noor heard 10% of a story and jumped to conclusions. 15% of this game is trying to find medicine to save Alma and then just one of your friends just decides to kill her and then he leaves. He is not in the game after this point. What the fuck is going on? Even when Alma's avatar dies, she, she, she has an avatar. She's a human projecting herself into an avatar, okay? Even when Alma's avatar dies, the characters come across as shallow, correcting themselves and referring to her avatar self as an it. And, and yes, this is just an avatar body. But even when she was alive and living in that body, they referred to her as an it. Alma's avatar dies and she is just then brushed off as a waste of time for our main characters. And the only feeling I'm left with here is just, man, that's a nice character. Why is everyone being mean to her? I don't like these characters anymore. And then you have Mercer. Now Mercer is a confusing one, as Ubisoft usually put a lot of time and pride into their villains. But outside of what could have been a solid opening for him, you kind of forget that he exists. You only really see him through him talking to his troops through like video calls once or twice, and then you see him at the end of the game. He doesn't really have in-game characterization. What does characterize Mercer is the RDA presence on Pandora with Mercer being the one giving the orders, the game tries to build up Mercer's character through the actions of everyone else. And the game does seem to be heading someplace interesting for Mercer's character with the abandoned tap facility. And no, not the one from the opening, a different one, hidden away in the mountains, engulfed in noxious gas. While exploring Pandora, you will randomly come across creatures that don't act like themselves. Metal decorates their body, and it is said that these creatures have had their connection to Awa severed. Godless creatures who mindlessly slaughter to distract themselves from the pain of being without connection. And as you investigate this facility, not only will you find these severed creatures stalking the halls, but you will also find the remnants of kidnapped children. Navi clothes thrown away in the trash. Chemical showers echo imagery of Navi children stripped of what they once were. And you are left with a horrifying thought. The animals of Pandora have a consciousness and a deep-rooted knowledge of the world due to their connection to Awa, something that the Navi share. But here, something inside them has been removed. And in doing so, has severed all mind and thought. What remains are monsters. But what if the RDA went further? What if the RDA played God? What if they severed a Navi? You are a part of the ambassador program. Teach the children to throw Awa to the wayside and embrace humanity. But what if this different facility severed that connection through the mutilation of children? Somewhere in this very building, there could be corrupt 
evil, mindless Na'vi. What if the RDA killed God's ability to speak? Oh wait, no! It turns out that these are your old children clothes and you were just transferred from one building to another when you were a child. The severed creatures? Yeah, they just broke in here. This isn't where they originate. Does the game dive any deeper into the severed? Nope. The twist in this mission is that you were kidnapped as a child. Weird how the game thought that was a twist, considering the whole opening is about children rebelling after the RDA kidnapped them. This mission is at the near end of the game and it's just regurgitating everything from the opening again. $120, please! <laughs> the game never delves into teaching you anything new about Mercer. Instead, you get to the end of the game basically knowing everything you need to know about Mercer just from the opening. Is that bad? No! Conveying a character in a short period of time that well is impressive, but it doesn't make for a rich character. Mercer's villainy is shallow. And it sucks. We can talk about Mercer's end soon, but for us to talk about that, we need to talk about Taylor. There are five children in the opening. Yourself, Ahari, who was killed, Renella, Noor, and Taylor. You are based. Ahari is womp womp. Raynell is a character who shows up sometimes. Noor is a bigot to half-breeds. And Taylor, well, Taylor is the best character in the game. Taylor is hands down the best written character in this game because he seems to be the only character with a full arc outside of your own. They tried something with Alma, but because it doesn't land, I kind of don't care. What makes Taylor different to the other TAP students is that he quite enjoys the way of the RDA, their food, their teachings, and he will act as a handyman helping you with any questions you may have about RDA equipment. Throughout the game, you will catch Taylor reminiscing about his time in the TAP program, something that no other character does. Everyone is glad to have left the RDA life behind. You can see all the TAP students adopting Navi clothes, except for Taylan, and it is through the past manipulations of Mercer that Taylan falls from grace and lets Mercer manipulate him in the present. You know how we spoke about the attack against the resistance that throws us into the third act of the game? Yeah, that happened because Taylan led Mercer to you. Mercer tells Taylan that all can be forgiven if he is able to talk with the resistance leaders, only for him to bomb strike the base with Mercer's excuse to Taylan being that the resistance is the sole reason behind all the hostilities from the RDA and that the resistance try to attack him once more and it was self-defense. It is after this point that Taylan, until the very end of the game, he is gone. He has realized he fucked up and has just full blown joined the RDA. Taylan, talk to me. Where are you? I can come and bring you back to the resistance. Okay. Where do you want to go? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter now. Everyone's worried about you, Thelan. I'm worried about you. You're gonna be angry. You'll hate me too. I did this. You can't blame yourself. But I am to blame. He said nobody would die. He said... Who said? <laughs> we talked on my radio. He told me we could be together again. Like a family. And so, I told him when the party was happening. Wait, Mercer? You told Mercer things about us? He needed to know when to arrive, so he could keep the soldiers away. Let me come get you. No. I don't belong there anymore. Which had me really fucking confused when the game bugged out and I randomly walked through the base and... You... It can be argued that Taylan is stupid for falling for all of this, and he is. Taylan is the only character that took the TAP program seriously, and in doing so, stayed a child and never dreamt of the day that he could be free. But it's through your journey as a Sauron 2 that you make an attempt to wake Taylan up from the lies. At the start of the game, you hum a song as it is all you have ever had. You were so disconnected from your clan that you couldn't even remember the words to a lullaby. But after meeting the Kamatiri, you are able to hear the words of the song of your people through some memories. Satnam. 
na lupa luten mo ma evi zena hivahao. This. Is your journey complete? Through learning the ways of Ewa, you fully reconnected with the Sarantu ways and finally know the words to the song hummed from the opening. When finally confronting Mercer at the end of the game with Taylan by his side, you were able to show Taylan that he can change. He doesn't have to be afraid of not fitting in anymore. But how do you do this? By showing him that you reconnected with who you were always meant to be. You sing to him the song of his people. And you know what? They, they fucked up Taylan here too! Everything about Taylan is perfect. And by singing him the song from the opening in its completed form, you show him that he does not have anything to be scared about anymore. When you hum the song, you are disconnected and away from your people and it gets someone killed. But here, singing the song in its complete form, Knowing the words of the song, you show him that he too can walk the path of a true Navi. Look at all the things that I have learned. You can learn it too. Through you singing the song with the words, you're showing him. Taylor, I learned all of this because I wasn't afraid. You don't have to be afraid anymore. Listen to the song. Only the game does something fucking stupid here. Your character does not sing the song. The magic of the song is that you didn't know it and now you do. You used to hum it and now you can sing it. How does the game fuck up Talon? By making your character still hum the song. Talon, remember. Oh, are you serious? This is how you choose to go out with a children's song? of this song is that in its humming state, it could never help Taylan remember who he once was. He indicates that the song is on the tip of his tongue, just like everyone else. If he could just hear those words from a writing standpoint, that could be the key to making him remember that he is also meant to be a Sarantu. We are not me! Also, hate to break it to you, this is the last scene of the game! Talon literally, out of fear, aids Mercer in prepping a bomb charge that could destroy the entire upper plane. The game even shows you what a weak version of the charge can do minutes before this event. Is that what's causing the tremors? I haven't been able to get too close, but there's definitely- Father is waiting for us at the camp. I cannot return alone. I will carry your pain to the ones who caused it. Please! Priya, there is so much death here. So many killed. So much life destroyed. I'm going up to the drill now. Stop this from happening again. That doesn't turn tail on because he is a terrified dog on a leash. So why the humming makes him turn here is just beyond me. If they sung the song with the words here, it would have made for a beautiful representation of growth for not only your character, but the potential of Taylan's. But instead, you're left baffled, confused, and, and then the credits roll. That's it. That's the game. Characters' emotional beats get misread by the writers who made them. And where the game does get characters' arcs near spot on, fumbles their conclusion by forgetting what the point of the actual game was. In a poetic and cruel way, the game about remembering who you are forgets its own setup, concludes the best character's story by them forgetting what was so important about a song that they longed to remember. And if I remember correctly, I'm about to get killed. <laughs> I'm 
I'm not used to letting you live. But orders are orders. It's become clear to the General that killing you is no longer a viable option. You just keep remembering what you shouldn't. Who are you? What you should be asking is what, not who. And what I am is a messenger. What do you want? Uh, what is this place? This is your interrogation. A simulated reality where you get to fulfill your wildest dreams while we dig through your mind for the answers we seek. A simple task. Were it not for your memory loss. Memory loss? Oh, look. Let's keep this simple. You don't remember who you were, meaning you're a jolly little insect. But once those memories return enough for us to obtain the answers we seek, you become something else. Something we cannot contain. Forcing us to reset your mind. And by reset, you mean... Kill me. <laughs> you catch on quick. So what changed? This time, we are coming to you before you start waking up. My master wishes to speak with you in time. And when that time comes, they will ask for you to pick a side. A side? Hey! When should I be expecting them? <laughs> you won't. Big special thank you to Papa Sun, The Lonely Shepherd, Astral Phoenix, and Fancy Feet for being my lovely little pledges. I'll see you guys in the next video.